Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Facebook audience. We are delighted to have Linda Castillo joining us and Keith McCaffrey, both of whom are here before their actual publication date, which is Tuesday. But that worked out really well for Linda last year because she came um, on the same Sunday last year. And it was the first year you made the New York Times list, wasn't it? Yes, it was. No wonder you're back. Yes. <laughs> Me too. And Keith, Keith has been very kind, and over the years he has come here with a variety of authors, Nevada Bar, C.J. Box, who else? Uh, you have to hold the microphone up. Your friend who uh, lives, lived in South Africa for a while and writes about Africa. I did one with him. My friend who lives in South yeah, Africa yeah, writes about I'm having a And I can't remember his name. <laughs> Surely it wasn't Dion Meyer. Patrick, who do we know that lived in South Africa and writes about it that has been to the store besides Dion Meyer? Maybe Michael Stanley. Michael Stanley's two people. <laughs> <laughs> so probably not. <laughs> uh, Jassy McKenzie? No. Well, whatever. Whatever. But, right. In any case, thank you for being willing to join. Yeah. I thought Michael was already published, isn't it? Sorry? My book's already Did he come out last week? It came out on the third. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Well, so Linda's actually, this is her lodge party, and you're just along for the ride. I'm just along. Okay. Wonderful. Well, what I discovered on the way from bringing them over here from their hotel is that both of them are from Ohio. What are the odds? Linda lives in Texas, and Keith lives in Montana. So tell us about, tell us about Ohio. Well, I actually grew up in the western part of the state. Uh, uh, it's a little town called Ithaca, and of course, when I tell people from New York, uh, like my editor and my agent, that I'm from Ithaca, they're like, oh, Ithaca, New York. And I'm like, no, Ithaca, Ohio, population 79. <laughs> so yeah, I grew up uh, kind of a rural area, and uh, moved to Texas in 1985, so uh, I guess I'm really a Texan now, but it's always nice to get back to Ohio. I, I haven't been back to Ohio in some time. I grew up in Steubenville and in other parts of southeastern Ohio. My uh, cousin Billy McAfee is the police chief of Steubenville, who was involved in all those, uh, you know, the, the uh, social media rapes, as they called them. Okay. Anyway, okay. It's a it's a bad town. It's <laughs> run by it's, there's two warring factions. There's the Chicago mob and the Steubenville mob. Uh, it's just like the TV show Justified. It's just drug wars. My, my uh, cousin always says if he could get rid of 80 people, he could clean the city up. But it's a town of 15,000, and the football stadium holds 10,000. My father once told me he'd do anything for me as long as I got out of that town. And it's interesting because I grew up not too far from Amish country. And one of my most vivid memories is we would go fish for crappie and tap and leg. And my father and I, my little brother, would drive out there, and we'd rent a rowboat to fish for crappie. And coming in from the west would be the Amish and their horse and buggies, and they would rent some motorboats. That <laughs> <laughs> just doesn't seem right. That just doesn't seem right, no. no. Or that may give rise to a plot point in some future. <laughs> I haven't really thought about that, have you? No, I no you could have a boating, a boating homicide. When, when your fellow author at Minotaur, Paul Doyron, was here last Sunday, yes. we talked about the fact that his game warden investigator, and Keith, this is interesting for you too, is actually now the man in the game warden department in Maine who investigates hunting homicides, oh. of which there are a surprising number. Uh, who knew? So I you could, you could, you, he's- Mike Bowditch. Right, yeah. Mike, Mike Bowditch is yeah. the sleuth and Paul Doyron is the author, but anyway, I was thinking, here you are. You can have like a, a, a drowning homicide, right? Yeah, exactly. For Kate, exactly. Which would be really good. And Keith, you found all kinds of really cruel and unusual ways to kill people. Stuffing them in a chimney, oh. driving buffalo over a cliff. Um, this book, this book is actually for you pretty tame in terms of you know the crime scenes. Well, I think somebody does die. A <laughs> <laughs> little girl gets scared by it. Scared, almost scared to death by a scared girl. That doesn't count. But the point of the book really is the. But you know, the, the book is, is a, sort of a travelogue of a long float down the Gorge of Smith River in Montana. And not long ago, somebody did drown there just a couple of weeks ago in high water. But not intentionally, right? No, no. 
Right, St. Patrick now has the postcards of the, that was just gonna go on that exhibit, but maybe you'd like to pass the postcards around because they are so gorgeous. In any case, yeah, I thought it was a love letter to the Smith River, but there, there is in fact, if you look at the cover of Keith's book called The Death of Eden, a snake. I've been trying for seven covers to get a snake on the cover. I finally did. <laughs> and you finally succeeded, huh? Yeah. And uh, it's a plot point in the book, so it's not just there for decoration. Sure. But now I hear from rumor arising in the back room that you do like snakes. You know, I, I absolutely have no fear of snakes. Of course, I'm not going to, you know, handle a rattlesnake or anything like that, but I have never been afraid of snakes. And, you know, growing up in a rural area, uh, you know, you run into them all the time. And still living in Texas, uh, we, we have uh, 75 acres in uh, Texas Hill Country, and um, I've, I've seen plenty of big, uh, big rat snakes down that area. Rattlesnakes are a little scarier. My younger daughter, our younger daughter and husband live in North Scottsdale. They've had a, a rattlesnake resident in their pool equipment for the last year or two, but recently he decided to go and live under the barbecue. And so alarm, the dogs were alarmed, my daughter was alarmed, so she called the rattlesnake people who will come and get the rattlesnake, but they said that she had to keep him from leaving the yard. So she threw rocks at him to, I'm hoping from a distance, um, to keep him from slithering out under the wall and away. So we, we even even here, still have nature red and tooth and claw. Right, but you, this, your snake's a rattlesnake. Yeah, and I was I was the guy who would be called out to catch him to do Were you? Yeah. You've actually, I thought you were a fishing guy, not a herpetologist. No, no, I'm an amateur herpetologist. I, by the time I was a, in kindergarten, I could name all 220 species and I knew the Latin names of most of them. So they were, snakes were my life for a number of years when I was a kid. So to the point where the you know, neighbor kids were not allowed to play with them. Because <laughs> they knew I had snakes and my, my grandmother would put towels under the door so that my snakes wouldn't get her. <laughs> no wonder you grew up to write for Field and Street. <laughs> could easily, easily see that. So, Linda, um, why don't you start us out in a gathering of secrets? It begins with a flash, actually a fire. You know, it, it does. This is actually, it's hard to believe, this is the um, 11th book in the series. Actually, it's book number 10 in the series. I'm currently working on number 11. And the book starts out, it's got a prologue and uh, a, a historical uh, bank barn in Amish country uh, burns to the ground. And, and you know, barn fires happen. Uh, you know, of course, some of the Amish still use lanterns, and so there's a flame source. And Kate Burkholder, who is the formerly Amish chief of police, goes to investigate. And as she's, uh, you know, the fire department's there, the sheriff's department's there, uh, the Amish family, they realize that their 18-year-old son is missing. And until they get the fire extinguished, um, you know, they lay down five or six thousand gallons of water and things cool off, uh, there's a body discovered inside the barn. And of course, uh, nobody knows until after the coroner has a look and it is determined later that it is the son. And that is sort of the, uh, the spark that really gets the story going. Uh, this young man who was killed is a, a much loved uh, young man. He's easy going. Um, everybody loves him. As Kate starts delving into his life, um, she realizes that he has a lot of secrets and uh, that the, his death may not have been uh, accidental. So, her own Patrick, can I hear music? I swear I can hear music. I just heard a little bit. I can hear music. Yeah, yeah. right. Maybe we have a quite extent, right? Um, this is a, a book where she really has to, I mean, she's always part of the Amish community, but she gets involved with some women who have a really interesting business in this book. Yeah, if you've ever been, how many of you have been to Amish country, um, either Lancaster County or Holmes County? Um, it, so if you've been there, you know there are a lot of uh, sort of uh, tourist shops, mom and, top, mom and pop type shops, and many of them, in fact, most of them are Amish owned. And uh, part of the scenes and part of the action takes place in one of those shops shop is peppered with some uh, 
interesting characters who are, you know, involved in the mystery that's unfolding as you as you read the book. So it makes you aware that they depend on tourists. Not totally depend, but anyway, tourist income is, is obviously a major component of that, their economy. That is absolutely true. And you know, there is, you know, uh, there are different levels of uh, conservatism among the Amish. I mean, if you look at the, the sports and trooper Amish, very, very uh, conservative, and they have, uh, they still exercise their tenet of uh, uh, being separate from the rest of the world. And then you have the beachy Amish who, you know, many of them are allowed to use cell phones or computers or drive cars. And so in this book, I really delve into some of those different Amish sects, which I think, uh, uh, you know, they're so different. And, you know, a lot of people don't know that they, they just <coughs> that the church districts have so many different kinds of rules. They really do. I mean, it's hard to, to keep up with it. And I've always thought that the whole idea of, uh, is it called Rumspringa? Um, is is fraught with risk, you know, because you have these kids that are brought up in these greedy really conservative families, and then suddenly they're turned loose with like no rules. And I often wonder, you know, if how many of them come to grief because they just don't know what to do with it. You know, uh, there was a story out of Holmes County, uh, probably a year, maybe two years ago, and there was what's called an Amish rager. And it's this big outdoor party where all of these Amish youths gather. I mean, there's music, there's alcohol, and uh, marijuana, and who knows what else. I mean, food trucks are brought in, they're huge. And the uh, Holmes County Sheriff's Department made 74 arrests. If you can believe that, of Amish young people, you know, 16 to 22 years old, and, you know, in talking with people, I've learned that sometimes, you know, Amish as children, they, they tend to lead very protected lives. And once they get that freedom, um, they can't handle it. They have a difficult time handling the freedom. And so they go overboard a little bit. And uh, it was a really, really interesting story. Yes, I can see that. And Keith, you have gone. Um, in your book, part of your plot stems from the fact that, once again, you have young people who are caught up in teenage dynamics and hormones and so forth uh, as part of the mystery, or part of part of the backstory, anyway. Sure. Yeah, I, my uh, my main character, Harold Littlefeather, uh, well, he's, he's my main character in this book. He has a son that he didn't know that he had, Marcus. And I don't know why I did that. I got to chapter two and not there he was. <laughs> and it really, it really, really works. I just met Marcus and I, that first meet was. Well, he, he, I had a, a kid uh, who, who lived with me and I didn't get uh, for a while, and that's why I modeled that character after. It's interesting, you know, because I had more Indian uh, parts to this book, I had uh, more Indian. It's, it's interesting because often they'll want me to do things more extreme to talk about, you know, on Indian time, which could be considered an insult, but no, not to them. It's like, no, that's the real thing. But uh, anyway, it's, uh, I, I, one of my readers is, or the guy who uh, criticizes my book is, is Dr. Joseph McKeshek, who's a professor of, you know, Indian studies. And I had him read the book. And this is to show you how dire the situation is for Indians in a lot of our seven uh, reservations in Montana. He called me after a few days, and he says, I'm sorry, he says, I'm going to have to uh, wait a couple more days to finish the book because my, my uh, brother just died. He was not the first time a brother of his had died. And his brother was, you know, probably a meth addict. And uh, we had horrible, horrible cold weather to the point where like, the National Guard was called out. And uh, there would be alleys with snow drifts as high as this, you know, as high as this room. And he passed out and froze to death. And so Joe said, you know, this is what happens. He seemed to take it in stride. It was very odd. And I said, well, my book's not important. You know, if you're, you're 
brother died. But. I was I was really thinking about the long chain of friendship between these two men when you know they were children and they were living on. Oh, the you're talking about that? Yeah, 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 yeah. That was what I was really oh, referring I'm sorry. to. No, yeah. that's okay. There's more parts to the book than just yeah. one. Well, I tried to weave in Harold's story where he's looking for the person who made, makes these scarecrows with the story of two boys who grow up on either side of the Smith River and end up on either side of the copper mine issue, uh, who sort of have a buried past and that they were both in love with the same young woman have, uh, and have been affected gravely by the tragedy of her death. And, uh, so they take a long float down the river with a documentarian uh, to talk about the copper mining issue. And I sort of wanted the story to follow the flow of the river and have it start sort of benign and become more dangerous, which it does once the snow melt occurs, and to somehow weave Harold's story into that. And I often will have a, like a larger backdrop issue, whether it's wolves or bison or Ernest Hemingway in my last book. Um, and, but in this time, it was sort of well, I thought it was interesting in reading them because I didn't know it when I first suggested that we pair up, that each of you would wind up with, you know, teenage boys and um, romantic encounters with teenage girls and how that would then shape their entire lives, however long it was. And it's, you know, the things that happen to teenagers because they don't necessarily have great judgment or they can't brain and their emotions. I thought it was very powerful in both your stories. Right. That first meet between True Blood and the other, you know right away that there is a big problem between them, but we don't know what it is. And it was it was just really, really well done. Well thank you. Some of those are based on, you know, characters who are sort of real what true blood in particular. Yeah. Just be a and then it's Ted True Blood who was a writer for So I have one big issue to ask each author about, and I started out um, asking this because you and Paul are doing something of the same thing. He and his Mike Bowditch last week and you, which is you know sometimes pushing an investigation may not really be the best thing for everyone concerned, and this is a big problem for Kate in yes. this book. You know, if do no harm is is like the credo for a doctor, you know, for someone in medicine. Does that also apply to law enforcement? And do you wind up doing more harm than affecting good if you pursue something, or is justice absolute? It was really a very tough issue. You know what? It really, really was. Because if you think about it, you know, that's a difficult thing to talk about without giving away too much. I'm trying to be big. <laughs> but it's, it's um, you know, it's there are different kinds of justice. I really struggled with that. I really struggled. I talk to people and it's like, what is justice? And what it can do to somebody's life if they get justice or if you just leave it alone and let justice be. And that was something that I really struggled with on this book. I, yeah, I think, I think it's the first time in the series that there's yeah. been some ambiguity for Kate about yes. it at a certain point in the investigation, how far she should go with it. Yes, I just heard from uh, from uh, uh, a reviewer, I uh, actually did a uh, phone interview, and she thought I needed an epilogue. And I have to stop there, but she goes, you needed to put an epilogue on that. And oh, I'm not sure that I agree it, with that. It anything. hadn't really crossed my mind. No. Listen, I've always thought that when Scarlett went back to Tara that we shouldn't know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. or, or when the house burned down at Manderley and exactly. Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. De Winter were left. I didn't want to pursue them into their future life. I think I think that some things you, know, you should just leave to the reader. I to absolutely her. agree. And that was my goal um, when I did that. <coughs> there were some things, you know, the reader can decide for themselves what happened. You sort of plant the seed and the reader can run with it and however that but, but it can really, you know, ruin a lot of lives, not just the, the people directly involved. And that's what happens to Mike Bowditch 
when he goes off to this island off the coast of Maine last week is that in the end, he probably did more harm than good. But on the other hand, do you really let a killer <coughs> go? Um, and I thought, wow, that's so interesting that the two of you are wrestling, you know, with yeah. um, how much damage. By the way, Keith, do you see the buffalo? I know. I do, yeah. I have, we put my pictures of Yellowstone up there, and oh, it's gone now. It'll cycle back. But I'll just break in and tell you this fascinating thing about, about Buffalo and Yellowstone. They now walk down the center of the road. So if you're driving along, all of a sudden, this enormous creature weighing thousands of pounds comes strolling down the yellow line. And I thought, so I went to my source, C.J. Box, who knows all things about Wyoming and Yellowstone. They said, what the hell? And he said, they have learned that in the winter, it's easier to let the snowplow do the work. <laughs> but they don't distinguish between winter and summer. So, I mean, I, if you stick around, you'll see that the buffalo is like from here, the car, you can see the, the, the wind, you know, the wing mirror and the whole bit. And some of my family in Dana's Avenue chastised me, why are you so close to the buffalo? Don't feed the buffalo. I said, we're cowering in the car. <laughs> <laughs> the buffalo has, and you know, you just have to hope it isn't going to actually like, you know, attack the car, but do they do that They almost Montana? never attack the car, but they do, go, they do gore the tourists. Yeah. Yes, in and the trees too. Yes. In particular, uh, right, right around uh, Old Faithful Man. Yes. There's a couple of old bull bison that hang out there. There are photos of them that will cycle those up are, here. Those are the ones that people <laughs> approach, and there are right. a number of people tossed, and, and there have been people killed historically yeah. by them. They stroll through the parking lot and nibble on the grass on the verge. So anyway, I was distracted. I should never let this thing roll while I'm sitting <laughs> I get distracted, but anyway, um, right. So so Mike has gone off to a place where, um, where deer are so overpopulated that they are starving, tick-ridden, and genetically unsound, but the islanders don't want to have them culled. And so it's it's a disaster, and that's kind of a background for was there a honey, was the woman who was shot while hanging up her sheets mistaken for a white-tailed deer, and therefore it's a free kill, or did somebody actually kill her and then pretend it was a hunting accident? What a great premise. I wonder you if know, it is. is. I like the, the Bovich series. Right. So anyway, we talked about you when he was here, so I'm talking about him. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Over here to Keith. Um, let's talk about the copper mining issue because that really is the heart, the emotional heart of your book. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to me that my brother wanted me to write a story about the Smith River when I very, you know, when I started this series seven years ago, and he had one requirement that that the hero of it be a three-legged dog because there are a couple of friends of ours who float the Smith and they have a three-legged dog. And, uh, so I had this idea, this Cain and Abel story, Genesis, as I call it, everything but the fucking snake. <laughs> and then there was the snake. But, um, but no apple tree. Now, that's no, the only no missing apple. ingredient, but it's Montana. <laughs> so what, what, what was your question about that? <laughs> My question is, what you are trying to present in a reasonably even-handed way, oh, the, the pluses yeah. and minuses of copper mining, where they're going to actually well, the, wind up potentially polluting and ruining right. the Smith River. Well, when I started the book, when I started working on it, I didn't know about the, the mining issue, or I just heard that there was a chance. And But then I educated myself, and I had the idea of people growing up on different sides of the river and different sides of the issue. And I decided, you know, I don't want to write political books, so I'll have my characters. They can be political. I can have one person for the mind and one mind. And so for doing the research with this, you know, I went to a Department of Environmental Quality meetings, uh, talked to lots of people on both sides of the issue. I took a tour of the mine with um, sort of the... Uh, the mine project manager, who is American, who, who is from uh, Montana, who I learned later grew up on the banks of the river. I had no idea when I wrote the book, no idea at all. But but that but the, like many mines, that mine is, uh, is is run by outside interests. You know, it's actually Australia. Uh, 
So the argument is, well, if we're going to do the mine anyway, don't you want it done by Montana? So this, and that's this guy. And I took the tour, and they're, you know, they're very reasonable people. They have a different opinion, and uh, you know, I, I'm not uh, disfavoring, you know, copper mining. We need copper. When my son's house was broken into a few months ago, as he's renovating, what do they take? They take um, copper. Um, so, uh, and this is one of the richest deposits in the world. So. It sort of creates its own specific gravity in a sense. It's going to come out, but but then I don't know. So uh, I personally think yes, but we shouldn't have copper mining. Money. You know, next to the Grand Canyon, uh, Colorado, and uh, the River of No Return, the Middle Fork of the, uh, the Salmon River. That's probably the most celebrated river that we have. It's the Montana Snook River, and the uh, Copper mine was proposed to dig directly underneath the major spawning tributary of the stream. So well, I, uh, well, I'm not going to let him get away with that without saying something. <laughs> right, right. Well, to make it more complicated, Keith um, does bring up a question. One, one of these two young men that we talked about who are now older, one of them is in favor of the mine, and the other is against it. So the conflict between them is arising from the mine. But I recall when when the same young daughter that threw rattlesnakes, I made two stones with the rattlesnake and I were in Peru um, a year ago, May, and up in the Sierra Blanca, there's a whole town that is gradually succumbing to cancer. And it comes from the mine tailings and the, the mess that the mining company has left behind. And so the obvious question is, well, why don't they clean it up? And the answer is, and the same thing that Keith is talking about, most of these big mining companies are Canadian or Australian, and they go into a country like Peru, and they do the mining, and they make the mess, and then they go away and it dissolves, and there's no way well, the to company pursue dissolves the company because does. There's no, And then there's nobody to sue. Exactly. Do there's no America money, too. nobody to sue, and the Peruvian government is just too poor. Uh, to you know, to do the cleanup itself. So meantime, all these people are dying, and you have that argument is raised in your book about you know if if we have this company come in by the time they're done and dissolve, the then we will clean it up. By the time the holding pond reaches or whatever, there will be no company. Right. And uh, that's a very real issue. Well, it is, and not just in Montana. No, not was, just in was Montana. my point. Yeah. But it's, it's a great source of conflict in your book where you have, you know, people on both sides of it. Right, and you handled it very even-handedly. I mean, I'm, I'm only about um, a third of the way into the book, but it was very even-handed. You, you presented both viewpoints and in a very fair way. Oh, well, thanks. I tried to. <laughs> so one last parallel. Um, between them is that in each book we've had a long-term romantic relationship um, and it's moving along. He's perhaps more tortuous over the course of seven books than no. Kate. So tell us what's going on with Kate and her significant other. Uh, her significant other, uh, you know, Kate is the chief of police of Painter's Mill and John Tomasetti is uh, with BCI, the Bureau of Criminal Investigation, and they uh, uh, met in the course of the first book, and they occasionally work together whenever there's a there's a major crime. Usually, that crime is a homicide. And uh, I think in this book, more than any book, it was a, a very rocky start. I don't know if you've read the series, very rocky start for both of them. Uh, Thomas Eddy, um, I don't want to give away too much, but early on, he basically had the power to ruin her career and ruin her life. Um, that first book and I think in this book we really see more of the uh, putting down roots and a little bit more of a domestic side that we've not seen it you know in the past it's been kind of hard-edged and I think it's a little bit softer in this book. Right but at the same time you have this kind of building in conflict which is you know a they don't really go public and a me too age, it's getting more complicated as well. 
Um, and is it for sure that he can stay in this jurisdiction or is he subject to transfer? I feel like the devil in you is going to ruin him. <laughs> I mean, you know, you can't just let him settle into domesticity or whatever. That would be way too easy. And in fact, I just, uh, I've been in uh, correspondent, corresponding with a BCI agent. And I'll be in Ohio uh, next week, and we're going to talk about it. And I, I mean, it, I think eventually they are going to be found out. BCI is divided into different regions, right. and probably what will happen is he will get assigned to a different region because you know they're living together and they've kind of just not told anybody. Right. Some people know, you know, mostly the guys in Kate's police department know about it, but there will come. A they're going to, you know, probably Thomas said he's going to be the one to get into trouble. And I think it's probably going to be one of those cases to where he is really going to want to be involved. It will be a dangerous case, and he's going to be shut out. So he'll be outed by trying to I project think, Kate or something. Of yes. sort. Well, I mean, she's the police chief of Petersville, so I don't see where she would be going. But he works for an organization that has a broader remit, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah, she would be fine as, you know, chief of but I think he would probably get reassigned. I think it's just a little bit too, you know, fraternization is a little bit too cozy between them. Well, and it's, we are getting more attention paid to relationships right now than me too. I think it might be harder for them, you know, to yes. just tough it out. Yes, right. I think so, yeah. Hmm. I just reached the point where they might go to bed together for the first time. <laughs> and I wasn't sure I actually saw I didn't really see that coming. <laughs> but then I thought, well, he's, he's an interesting character. I like that. Yeah. And I like the fact that both John and Kate are not like the world's greatest detectives. They're not hot shots. They're very flawed people. They, they both are. of them. Right. And she's not, I mean, she's admirable, but she's not a, like a great policeman or a great She's uh, really not. Like most 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 books, you know. And I, I the think hero is good, really good at it. That's one of the things that I love about Kate. I mean, she's a small town cop, and she's actually uh, she was a detective with the uh, uh, division of police in Columbus. She's relatively inexperienced because she is so young, and uh, she is very flawed. Um, are you reading sworn to silence? Is that, yeah, that's the one. She, well, she's fired. And she's going yeah. to bed with him, and I don't yeah. know what happens after that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's the first book. <laughs> yeah, she makes, I mean, she was in quite a dilemma in that first book, and I can't really say what that was, but it was a, it was a really tough dilemma, and uh, she couldn't talk about certain things that may have helped solve the crime. Maybe That's right. I don't, yeah, yeah. You can't give it and away. And he knew. Right. He knew. He yeah, she knew proud. from the beginning that yeah. she wasn't quite being honest. Plus, right. they both have a lot of baggage, and, you know, what fun would it be if you had a person in a crime novel that didn't have a lot of baggage? Less baggage. The no more the I know. All right, and Keith, so over here we yeah. have Martha and Sean who have had a on-again, off-again, somewhat tortured relationship involving other people, I might add, but now you seem to have sort of Briefly, well, at least brought them together. Yeah. It's always a dilemma when you have a main character and you have their girlfriend or boyfriend or husband or wife. Because if they aren't part of the story, where are they? Because they exist. Therefore, they have to be dealt with. So they can be like an anchor around you. <laughs> and I started out very early having Sean Stranahan be like 60% of the book and Martha Evans are 40%, 60-40. And that's generally not advised by publishers. Right? They want it more 80-20, 70-30, but not 60-40. Then, there are, then there's too much, if, if each character has the same amount of weight, that's hard to deal with. But, you know, I got to the second chapter of the first book and I had, had a sheriff and that name popped to mind and it turned out to be a woman uh, who's named after my best friend Karen her husband's very good about it. <laughs> 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 Letting you steal his wife's name for yeah, yeah. criminal purposes? <laughs> no, as, as my girlfriend, basically. <laughs> but, uh, but 
but I, I've had a lot of people tell me, well, you know, this has to go somewhere or not. So it goes somewhere now. And so I'm going to have to learn how to do that. But you also need Martha Cates is, after all, a chief of police, and Thomas Eddy well, is an agent. But Sean is not, you know, a formal no. lawman. So you really do need a sheriff. Right. And every, every book I say, well, this should be Martha's book. This should be Martha's book. It is, it's hard to do it. For one thing, I, I, I don't want to write a police procedural. I'm not qualified, even though I've got a police chief in the family and I have judges and other people that I rely on for expertise. So, yeah, you know, she's by the book in the sense that she's official. And I deliberately make the county force be smaller than it normally would be so that she would actually get out and do things and not just be a pencil pusher. But yes, I have to get Sean Stranahan involved, even though he's not t technically a law person. So that's always, you know, hard to weave it. A little, a little bit of a dance to do that. Yeah, it's a get dance. both of them involved. Right. Yeah, I agree. And then, you, and then when you're writing, just as in terms of the technical thing when you write, um, if they're in the scene together, because these are the, really the only two characters I get into their heads, the cook or maybe her. Yeah. Well, whose point of view is it? And so it's all it's the point of view of the person who's actually the major character in that scene. That's the way I do it. Anyway. Right, right. But it's something you have to think about. Well, neither relationship is going to just sail smoothly along, no. so it will be interesting to see how it works. I am going at this moment to say goodbye to our Facebook audience and thank you for joining us. And did everybody get... Um, that has his book that you